welcome to Shoot 'Em Up. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Shoot 'Em Up is a story where we get to witness the evolution of story from story to script to screen live. And the show works in a three night process with one show a night spread out over three months. First, we'll hear true stories told live. Then we see live radio st style play readings of those scripts. And then those scripts are randomly paired with directors who have a month to go away and make a short film based on the scripts that they were paired with. And this is not something you can or will see anywhere else. Usually all we get to see is the finished product and not the process. So thank you guys for coming tonight for the first part of the process, the stories. We have six amazing storytellers for you this evening. So let's get started. Our first storyteller coming to the stage, when I asked her, why do you love storytelling? She said, I like sharing because I feel like it's a gift to people and a gift to me too. Please welcome to the stage, Roz Brown. Carmen Morales. Woo! It's 1978. I'm 17 years old. I live in the best city in the world, and I have the best friend ever. Her name is Clarice. Clarice is two years older than me, has a big afro, big brown eyes, and she looks just like Diana Ross. And the best thing about it, she lives in the street over from my house. I could see her front door from my bedroom window. So when I would wake up in the morning, I would open the shades to see if I see her coming or going. We went everywhere together. Our usual spot was the Sugar Shack. That was in the combat zone in downtown Boston, where all the smut and porn shops are. You would see all kind of things down there. One time on our way to the Sugar Shack, we saw this prostitute standing in front of the sky, digging in his pockets and shaking them up and down. Clarice said, see that, Rosie? That's what you call rolling a trick. I must have had a strange look on my face because she said, Rosie, don't you worry about him. See, if you look closely, he likes it. He did have a funny smirk on his face, too. Yeah, that's why he comes down here to get rolled. See, I'm glad you're seeing this, because there are some things you just have to see to believe. If I had tried to explain it to you, you wouldn't have believed me. Stick with me, kid, and you'll learn a lot. And I did. I stuck with Clarice like glue. We even went to after-hour spots. That's where the real hardcore street people go. There ain't no looky-loos in there. Mm -mm. Everybody in there was in the biz. You know, the nightlife biz, except Clarice and I. We were in without being in. My other friend, Linda, was jealous of us. Because one day, I went by Linda's house, and she said, you know Clarice's sister, Jane, is in town, and you know she's a hoe. <laughs> I'm thinking, so what? Besides, I'm, she, I'm, I'm sure she's not, because Linda lies a lot. Her whole family lies. They just sit on their front porch all day and lie. <laughs> the next day, I went by Clarice's house, and in walks this girl with a big wig, a lots of makeup, and high heels. Dag, Linda was right. She's a hoe. <laughs> but that's okay, that's, that's her, that's not Clarice. Clarice would never be a hoe, she's too smart for that. Uh-uh, she would never do that. But that's how Clarice knew all them people down at the Sugar Shack, because her sister knew them. I know some people thought Clarice and I were hookers too. Even my brother Roger said to me, Roz, what are you doing down ha there hanging at the Sugar Shack? You're not out there doing anything, are you? Because you know people have been seeing you down there. And if it looks like one, talks like one, it is one. I said, I told him, no, I'm not one, but thanks for asking. <laughs> I kind of like being mistaken for a hoe. 
That was cool. <laughs> One day, I went by Clarice's friend Andrea's house. Andrea was new in town from, from Texas. I didn't know what she did either, but I knew she was not a hoe. She lived on Beacon Hill. But when I went there, she opened the door and pointed to the living room and went back to her bedroom. I walked in and noticed that Jane and Clarice both had on nightgowns and negligees. I'm thinking, it's 7 p.m. What are they doing, nightgowns on? Then I thought, well, maybe they're having a sleepover. Yeah, well, how come I wasn't invited? You know, I, I could have brought something to wear to the sleepover. I mean, I didn't have anything as nice as, nice as what they had, but I could have brought something. But I'm sure it was Andrea's idea. She didn't think I was cool enough to be invited to her sleepover. Jane, uh, uh, Clarice is doing Jane's makeup. So I look at Jane and I say, Jane, you're going to look good tonight down at the sugar shack. She says, child, who's going to the sugar shack? I'm going to stay right here and make some money. I'm thinking, how is she going to make money there? I mean, she was in an apartment. There's no tele uh, telemarketing equipment. There's no, no <laughs> typewriters. <laughs> what is she going to do? She has on a nightgown. That's when it hit me. This was a whole house, a brothel. Men were going to come here, and she was going to have sex with them. That's how she was going to make money. Andrea and Jane both were prostitutes, but Andrea was the indoor kind. That's why they know she was one. <laughs> this was exciting, because I had never been to a whole house before. Wait a minute. I thought, what's Clarice doing here? Oh, I knew. She was doing the makeup. Yeah, that was her job, making up the artists, the, the makeup artists for the prostitutes. You know, that's smart business thinking. <laughs> you know, why not take advantage of who you know? <laughs> and then I thought, oh, this is illegal. Vice might come here and take everyone to jail. I better go. But then I thought, no, I just want to see one. One trick up close and personal, because I want to see how they look, you know? They probably come in with blushed cheeks and look around. They're going to see me. They might think I was one, you know? But then I thought, well, I don't have a, a negligee, but that might turn them on that had on clothes. <laughs> and then no, Clarice is not, because she's doing makeup. But they, thought, they might have thought that I was just getting ready, a whole in preparation. Well, I'm just going to wait till the first one come, and then I'm going to leave. So I wait. 45 minutes go by, and there's not one knock on the door. This is sad. <laughs> you know, what kind of whole house is this? They can't get one customer to come to their brothel? I mean, where did Andrea advertise at a convict? I mean, did she pass up flyers or anything? I look at Clarice, and she's putting her makeup case away. And I say, Clarice, why are you doing that? You're going to need that to make money. She says, no, Rozzy, I don't need this to make money. I got all that I need to make some real money. See, I'm glad you're seeing this, because if I had tried to explain it to you, you wouldn't have believed me. There are some things you just have to see to believe. I didn't want to believe that. I didn't want to see that. I wanted to say, Clarice, come go with me. Let's go to the sugar shack. You don't need to do this. But I didn't say anything. I got up, put on my coat, and went home. The following day, morning, I don't look at my window, bedroom window. I kept the shades down. That's so stupid, a grown woman looking at the comings and goings of another human being. No. Besides, I had to study for school, yeah, because I was going to college outside of Boston next year. Yeah, there was nothing left in Boston for, Boston for me. Thank you. Roz Brown!
Oh my god, I got so enthralled in this story, I forgot it was my job to come up after you. Um, Roz, first of all, uh, I, I'd like your help in titling my memoir. You've, you've given me some good options so far. A hoe in preparation is my favorite. <laughs> I'm also thinking like a hoe prepares. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start telling people I'm an indoor kind of prostitute. <laughs> it's an important distinction I feel like. If that doesn't work out, I'll become a makeup artist of prostitutes. Okay, our second storyteller coming to the stage. When I asked him why do you love storytelling, he said because it's less pressure than doing stand up. Please welcome to the stage our producer and creator of the show, Monty Lamonti. Hannah Williams. Woo! Great job, Roz. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So I'm seven years old. It's my birthday, and I know exactly what I'm getting because I got the same thing for my birthday every single year when I was a kid, a brand new bike, and I loved getting a bike. A bike when I was a child meant freedom. I was an only kid. I had no one to, to speak with at home, no one to, 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 to get, get my problems out to. So, and none of my friends lived actually on my block, so when I had a bike, that was the freedom to go into different neighborhoods and meet people and whatnot. So even though I did get the bike and I was thrilled, I will admit I was always a little dissatisfied because every time I did get a bike, I wanted it to be new and I wanted it to be a Schwinn. Because, see, I grew up in Chicago and I lived on Costner, which was the same street as the Schwinn factory. So I felt I should have a Schwinn. But because my mother worked in a factory, and even though my dad th did things I'm not at liberty to speak of, he really didn't make a lot of money, you know? <clears throat> so, so I get the bike, and I loved it. But, like, but the thing is, the reason I got a new bike every year was because my birthday was in July. And come usually be before the end of August or September, I would ride my bike to Walgreens or some store to buy candy. And when I would come out, all I would find was the lock that I used to protect my bike on the ground, cut in half, bike was gone. Opportunity cost for being a, you know, a drug dealer in Chicago. You, get, you live in a bad neighborhood, that's what happens. And my dad understood that. So he knew the very next year I had to get a bike, which was a long wait. But my bike wasn't always stolen by someone snapping the lock. My ninth birthday is coming. I'm very excited because I know exactly what I'm going to get. It's going to be a new bike. And I really hope this time it's going to be a 10-speed. It's my birthday. I go outside. It's another dirt bike. And I was like, all right. See, I really wanted a 10-speed because when I was a kid, my cousin Tricky used to take me fishing. And there was a park in Chicago that was not in my neighborhood, but it was like four neighborhoods over. It was called Reese Park. And if you're not familiar, Chicago is super flat. But Reese Park had hills and it had ponds. And we lived too far from the lake, so we never went there because my family didn't have a car. So sometimes when my cousin Tricky would come over, Reese Park was closer. He would take me there and we could fish. But I got this dirt bike again, and it was used again. And I was very unhappy in front of my parents. But when I got out of my bike, I was very pleased. Not more than two weeks after getting that bike on my ninth birthday, I'm, I'm riding down a, a side street in my neighborhood, and I see this kid, and he's looking at me, and he's got this big grin, and I was like, who is that? And, and I'm getting closer, and I still can't make out who it is, but he was smiling so much while he was looking at me, I was like, we must know each other, and I start smiling, because I'm like, wow, now we're smiling at each other, and I'm like, man, who is this? And before I can think of, like, is this a guy from... Boom, he punches me right in the face, knocks me backwards off my bike, and takes off. It turns out he wasn't as happy to see me as he was to see my new bike, you know, or my used bike, which was now his bike, and I watched him ride away. And I was like, oh, all right, what are you going to do? And I cried, and I went home. <clears throat> so now I'm 13. It's my birthday. I'm so excited because I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I'm really hoping it's a 10-speed and it's a Schwinn. 
you know, plus I'm 13. I'm becoming a man. You know, I deserve this. I walk out into the yard. There's my bike. And guess what? It is a 10-speed, and it is a Schwinn. It's not a new Schwinn. It's used. But the other thing about it, I loved it, and the other thing I loved was it was competition orange. Now, I'm not a car guy, but the guys in my neighborhood, some of them were car guys. And, you know, a lot of the cars were either, like, red or black. But one dude, Tony Patera, had a car that was competition orange. And something about that just sounded so cool. And my parents didn't know that I loved that color, but I got the orange bike. And I loved it. And it was a 10-speed. And that meant that I could now bike to Reese Park and go fishing. And I called my friend Eddie at, at the night of my birthday. And I was like, dude, I got the 10-speed. Let's do this thing because we hatched the plan. So July 5th, because my birthday is the 4th, July 5th, we were on our way to Reese Park. We had our fishing poles and our tent speeds. And it was like the sky was the limit. And it was so awesome, like biking through different neighborhoods. And I lived in like, I always lived in a bad neighborhood because my dad was a drug dealer. And my dad was always like, people in bad neighborhoods don't call cops. So anyway, so like I started biking through like better neighborhoods and it was just fascinating. And it was like we we're on this voyage together and we had fishing poles. And I was like, this is what this is what books are made of. Great stories. Like I was so excited. And we get to Reese Park and we start fishing. And, and, and at this time, too, I have to tell you, I'm a huge metalhead. Like I loved Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, ACDC. So we get there, we start fishing and then we notice there's these two older guys there and they're fishing, too. And they have, one dude has an ACDC t-shirt on. I was like, yes. And another dude had an Iron Maiden t-shirt on. Like, doubled, yes. You know what I mean? And the thing is, so, okay, I say older guys. Now, I'm 13. These guys are like 18. But when you're a kid, that's a lot older. You know what I mean? That's a big difference. So anyway, they start talking to us. And they're really cool. And they're, like, interested in us. And they're asking us questions about our favorite bands. And, and in my neighborhood, the older guys, all they did was, like, give us wedgies and, like, put us in headlocks. Or, like, one guy used to, like, shoot dart guns at us. Like, we had to run past his house because he was my brother. He was my friend's older brother. And, like, it was terrifying. And these guys weren't terrifying. And it was like, this was great. And we were, we were hanging out for, like, 30, 40 minutes having a good time. We didn't catch any fish because it was a little pond, you know. But um, after a while, these dudes were like, hey, you guys want to come back to our apartment and we'll listen to some heavy metal records and we'll make some ham and cheese sandwiches? And I was like, heck yes. And my friend, Andy Butter, was like, yeah, we love ham and cheese and we love heavy metal. Let's do this thing. <laughs> so we start walking to their houses. <clears throat> and I don't know. No, I don't know where most people are from, but like out here, there's not a lot of alleyways. Or they, they, in Chicago, though, we have alleys. And a lot of times, you know, the block goes, two streets run like this, and there's an alley that goes like this, and there's like a T-section sometimes at the, the front and back of the alleys. <clears throat> so these guys are like, hey, you know what? Why don't we cut through the alley? It's a little bit quicker to get to our place. And I was like, perfect. I love going in alleys because when I was a kid, my dad, whenever I had to pee and we were out on a walk, my dad would be like, come on, boy, let's run in the alley. So like an alley was a comfort zone for me because that's where I peed as a child, you know? And um, so, so these guys are like, let's go down the alley. And we're like, yeah. So we go down the alley. So we're coming up the short end. And they're like, hey, let's cut down this way. So we cut down the long end. And I swear to God, it's like these dudes had this planned out. It, it happened so quickly, but it happened so perfectly timed. They both, like, spun like ballet dancers, like, on one foot. They turned back. As soon as we turned on that long strip, they turned and, and, and they look at both Eddie and I, and then just, boom, they punch both of us in the face. Eddie falls straight back, and the guy with the ACDC shirt takes off on Eddie's bike. Now, I don't know how this happened, because it doesn't agree with physics. But this dude punched me in the face, and instead of falling backwards, now keep in mind, too, I was this exact same size, you know? <laughs> I, so maybe now, maybe maybe physics does make sense because I got this thing. My center of gravity is a little bit off. But when he punched me, I didn't fall backwards. I fell forwards, and I fell right onto my bike, and I fell right into the back tire. And I just remember I looked up, and the guy looked at me like he was mad at me because I fell on the bike that he just wanted to take and run away with, and he couldn't get it. And I was like, fuck this, and I grabbed the back tire. And this dude just started to kick me over and over again and say, 
let go, you fucking fat fuck, let go. And he's kicking me in the face. And I start screaming like a madman. One, because it hurts to get kicked in the face over three or four times, you know, repeatedly. Uh, and plus, someone's trying to steal my bike. But I was like, you are not getting my bike. And he kept pulling and pulling, and at the same, and then it was amazing. I was screaming so hard and so crazy that this Polish guy comes running out of his house with a baseball bat. And the reason I know he was Polish, because neither, no one understood a word he was saying. But it was a lot of like, yakshimash, yakshimash, you know, whatever. And he comes running out, and, and there's a lot of Polish people in Chicago too. But he comes running out with his bat, and the kid in the, in the Iron Maiden shirt, which that really was heartbreaking, you know, like one of my metal brothers, he just takes off and runs, and I got my bike, and I'm bloody, and my bike is there, but I was so happy that I start to hug this Polish guy, and I'm ble bleeding out of him. He's going, no, 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 get off, get off of me, get off. And then he, like, pushes me away, and he's like, oh, my God, and he's like, no, go home. You must go now. Go. And, and then, and then, um, and, and then Eddie and I now, we're walking home, which really freaking pissed me off because I had a bike. You know, like, why I now I have to walk, like, four miles? Like, let Eddie take the bus, you know? But anyway, we get home. I got my bike. I was so thrilled. And that bike then was, like, that was, like, my, my trophy. You know what I mean? Like, I had a trophy bike now. Like, now it didn't matter that it was used. It didn't matter that even though, like, it was competition orange, but I must admit, I could tell it was spray paint because it chipped so easily. It was just, like, a cheap paint job over the bike. But, um... I love that bike. So then one day I go to Walgreens because they had penny candies, the Brock candies, and you put the pennies in the little thing. And anyway, I get, I go in there, I get my candies, and I come out after locking my bike up, and I see my lock on the ground, my bike gone. And I was so upset. And I just did that. You know when you're, like, crying but laughing at the same time? And I'm like, oh, and I'm opening the Brock's candy and eating them to, like, feed myself some sugar or whatever and like to feel better and it was a horrible thing and I and then after that <clears throat> I made the decision I said you know what I will never buy a lock for a bike again because if I am not with my bike it can get taken from me if I'm with my bike you are not taking that bike from me no how no way well anyway now I'm like 27 or 28 years old, and I, ha I had a Schwinn, which is what I wanted always. I bought my own Schwinn. Uh, because at this point in my life, I was now doing things in Chicago I was not at liberty to speak of. So I had a lot of money. <laughs> so I buy a bike, and I live in this apartment building where like, I had like a nine-foot gate in the front and a nine-foot gate in the back. And I was like, you know what? I can get a lock for my bike. I mean, you, you got to get over that damn thing. And I mean... I I don't ever think of climbing fences because I can't do it. So I don't think anyone else does it. So I'm like, you can't get over that gate and get to my bike. So I, I got a lock for the bike. So one day I go, I do a 10-mile bike ride. I come home. I go in. I'm like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to go get lunch. I go in, and I have no hair, which means I shower really quick. So I'm in and out in like 15 minutes. I come out. The lock is busted and on the ground, and my bike that I had for about 15 years was gone. And I was really upset. But you know what? <clears throat> it was at that point that I realized, I was like, you know what? I should be grateful because I'm in a position where I can buy a bike. And all those years when I was younger and I was ungrateful to my parents and I was always being like a whiny little baby, that I was unhappy that I got used bikes. Like, what was I thinking? They did the best they could. My parents bought me a bike every year until I was 16 years old. Do you realize I had, I had over 10 new bikes I always got a bike. No one gets that many bikes in their lifetime, period. I had that before I was 17. You know what I mean? It was amazing. And I was such an ungrateful brat. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and, and, and I just bought myself a new bike, and it was amazing. I'm like, yeah, I can do it. And I always wanted to repay my parents, but I, that, kind of, that went in and out of my mind. It slipped out of my mind. So anyway, my dad is now deceased, so now my mother comes to visit us. Here. So we have lived here for almost three years now. So she, she comes up here all the time. And um, I have bikes again. My wife and I share bikes. And now we have them locked up outside of our place. And when, the last time my mom was here, she noticed the bikes. And she's like, oh, look at that. And she's like, you know, I've been thinking about getting a bike. Because my mom just lost like 50, almost 100 pounds and whatever. And she's like, I've been thinking about getting a bike. And, and maybe I should. 
And I realized, you know what? I never got to let my dad know how amazing it was that he always took care of me and hooked it up. But this year, when my mother turned 73, she's getting the most grateful bike a son could ever give. My name is Monty. Thank you. Monty Lamonti. Well, that was like the Shawshank Redemption of bicycle stories, Monty. I mean, I, I have to say that, like, you get a bike every year, every year you get punched in the face, the bike gets stolen every, you know what I mean? It's like, who, what's that Greek tragedy, the guy who's, like, pushing the boulder up the hill? Syphilis, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like the Chicago version of that, I feel like. Um, Chicago's a great city. Like, when I went there, I was like, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. The architecture, the culture. Look at all these guys with jobs. So our next storyteller, when I asked him, what do you love about storytelling? He said, I love the simple, honest relationship between a storyteller and an audience. So please welcome to the stage, Paul Davis. Jordan Bashar Rod. Bashar. Woo! Good luck. A few years ago, I flew back home to Arizona to visit my family. While I was home, I was going to go see some friends at a bar one night. So I borrowed my brother's car, drive out to the bar, meet up with my friends. Uh, I have two beers. And then my friends say, hey, we're going we're gonna to head to someone's house for a party. So I say, awesome. So we all kind of divide up between our cars. My friend Carly hops in my passenger seat. We swing by a liquor store right next door, uh, pick up a bottle of vodka for the party, and then we're on the road. And I'm not driving for two minutes before whoop, woo, red and blue flashing lights in my rearview mirror. So I pull over, and I'm immediately panicking because I've always been so careful my entire life about not drinking and driving. And I only had two beers, but I fly into full self-preservation mode and I start scouring the car for anything I can drink to hopefully mask the potential scent of a little bit of beer off my breath. I can't find anything in the car except one huge fast food cup in the cup holder. And I just think, please, God, let there be something in here that I can just drink really quick. So I pick up the cup and jackpot. It's like half full. So instinctively, I just put the straw in my mouth and I start chugging. I pull in the hugest mouthful, like like an elephantine mouthful. And right off the bat, I can tell something's not right because I can't immediately identify what it is that I'm drinking. I thought it was going to be some, uh, some soda with melted ice, watered down, um, but it's thicker than I thought, and it's a little minty. So I think maybe it's like a melted milkshake, but I'm already swallowing down that first mouthful, pulling in the second huge mouthful, and I think it can't be a milkshake. This is not sweet like a milkshake. And it's not until I'm swallowing the second mouthful that I realize what it is that I'm drinking. And I'm ashamed, so ashamed, that it took me two mouthfuls to figure out what it was because I know my brother so well and I know his habits. My brother chews tobacco and when he's driving, he uses empty fast food cups and just spits right down in the straw. Easy cleanup. Because what could go wrong there, right? So I'm sitting there trying to process the fact that I just drank two giant mouthfuls of my brother's tobacco flaked spit. I take the straw out of my mouth. I put the cup back in the cup holder. My hand is shaking, right? And Carly can immediately tell that something's wrong. And I, I don't know the expression that's on my face, but she's looking at me with such concern as if... I just witnessed a pedestrian get hit by a bus or something. And she's like, oh, my God, Paul, what's wrong? And I look at her, and I, I can't even get words out. I just look back forward. I put my hands, still shaking, on the steering wheel. Now, at this point, it's only been like 30 seconds since I've been pulled over, uh, less than a minute. The cop is getting out of his car, and he's walking up to my window, and I have the awful realization that... I'm going to throw up. I mean, there's no way 
I'm not going to throw up. My body has to reject what's just been put inside of it. And I'm fighting the urge as strong as I can, but my body is doing that one thing where you're like, <laughs> but I'm doing everything I can to fight it. And my brain is saying, don't you dare puke in your lap in front of this cop. There's no way you're going to be able to convince him that you haven't been drinking. So I'm fighting it with all of my urge. He, he comes up to the window. He says, license and registration. So I'm just like, <laughs> He takes my license, takes it back to his car, and Carly said, Paul, please tell me what's wrong. I'm so scared. And I say, I, I can't tell you. I couldn't say it. I was so freaked out and ashamed. I was on the verge of tears, and I knew saying it out loud. I wasn't ready to admit it to myself. I knew I just had to get through the next couple minutes. So I say, Carly, just give me something to drink. She says, we don't have anything. I say, find something. I just need to rinse my mouth out right now. And she says, we have a bottle of vodka. <laughs> now, had you told me at the beginning of the day that by the end of the night, not only would my perfect DUI record be in jeopardy, but while pulled over, I was going to be giving strong consideration to drinking vodka while the cop is running my license. I would have said, I don't believe you. I'm a pretty good writer, but there's no situation that I could fathom which has me drinking vodka while pulled over. Yet, there I was, considering it nonetheless. Life, it turns out, is a better writer than all of us. So not only am I considering it, in the moment, it seems like the most reasonable course of action. I don't just want to drink that vodka. I need it right then. I need to pour it straight into my stomach to kill any bacteria that's floating around in there. I want to burn off the inner lining of my mouth skin and esophagus. Rubbing alcohol would be better, but all I have is a bottle of vodka, and my brain is chiming in again, don't you dare drink that vodka while you're pulled over. They're going to release that dash cam footage to America's dumbest criminals. And I know it's a bad idea, but logic isn't really playing into my decisions here. So I turn to the back seat where the bottle of vodka is, and I can see in my back window the cops already coming back to my window. So I straighten back up. He gets to my window, and he says, son, is this your car? And I'm like, no, it's my brother's. And then he hands me back my license and says, Tell your brother to fix his tail light. Have a good night. And then he strolls off into the darkness, unaware of how he'd altered my night, nay, my life. Because I still wake up at night sometimes in a cold sweat, thinking to myself, my God, I drank my brother's spit. So much of it. <laughs> two beers I drank that night before that fateful drive. And for those two beers, the universe thought to balance everything out by punishing me with two heaping mouthfuls of my brother's tobacco-flaked sputum. And I can't help but think, hey, universe, you might have overdone it just a pinch. I probably would have learned my lesson after the first mouthful of my brother's spit. Now, anytime I think of that stupid childhood joke, do you spit or swallow? I always think to myself, neither. I swallow spit. Paul Davis. Paul, I think I think I can I can say that I have never uh, in any form of of storytelling of any variety seen anyone use urine as a red herring before. <laughs> How many people here thought that Paul drank two mouthfuls of his brother's piss? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. And I, I feel like that you swallowing two mouthfuls before you realize that you, you were drinking your brother's spumen, spumen, what do, <laughs> tobacco flex spumen, um, before you realized what it was, uh, it's such a perfect metaphor for so many things in life, you know, 
like every guy I've ever dated, that's what it feels like. <laughs> there were so many signs. Our next storyteller coming to the stage, when I asked her, what do you love about storytelling, she said, I want to connect with people and share my humiliation from my younger years, because there's a lot of it. So please welcome to the stage, Meg Chang. <laughs> Woo! Yes, Meg. Um, Brian Finkelstein. Woo! Um, so when um, I was in eighth grade, uh, I was really, really skinny. I developed very slow. Um, all the other girls got really nice boobs and stuff, and I just looked like I was 10. And so because of that, I got tormented by all the boys. And um, they followed me around school, and they called me Boney because I was skinny. And then Boney somehow morphed into Boner. So. Every time I was walking to class, I just heard, boner, it's boner, and um, which was funny because I clearly wasn't giving anyone boners. <laughs> and, um, but what was probably even worse than that was um, they would always tell me that I was a pirate's dream because I had a sunken chest. Um, yeah, so fuck you, eighth grade. Um, and, well, actually, it's kind of funny. A few months ago, I looked up one of these guys on Facebook, and um, he, he looks like he's living the life of a loser, so that made me feel better. Um, so fast forward, to, um, <laughs> fast forward to when I was 22 years old, and I moved out to New York City. I had grown up in California, and I was very lonely. I didn't have any friends, and I was working this um, restaurant job and getting paid $7 an hour in cash under the table um, as a hostess. And um, through that job, I met um, the friend of a coworker, and he was um, a man, and he was beautiful. He looked just like George Michael, and um, and he was foreign. He was from South Africa, and he had an accent, and it was so hot. And his name was Costa, and guys, he was interested in me, and he asked me out, and we started dating, and. I was just uh, obsessed with him. He was so cool. Like, he, he did things like he loved to drink whiskey and play poker. And apparently, um, he was a really good rollerblader. So when he was a teenager, he was um, sponsored. And, <laughs> and, um, and he was also really smart, too. So this was the other thing. Besides being hot and cool, he was studying computer science. So he was smart and practical. And um, the other cool thing about him was he had a pet snake. Um, so all of this combined made for the perfect man. And I, I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. Like, this must be my reward for everything I suffered in eighth grade. Like, I get blessed with this perfect man who I'm going to marry. Um, so um, our first Valentine's Day together, I just was so excited. I was like, what romantic thing is this guy going to do for me? So he told me to meet him at his apartment. And, um, and I, I was waiting for my surprise. And then he just said to me all regular, like, oh, we're actually going to um, go to my friend's birthday party. And I was like, oh, um, OK, at least we're together. And then he said, but before we do that, we need to go buy him a gift. And he specifically asked for gay porn. Um, so we had to go get that. And um, then he told me, oh, you know what? I'm really tired. Let's go back to my place, and I'll take a nap. So I was like, OK, so I guess we're not going anywhere. And he took a nap. And around 9 PM, I got really bored. So I woke him up, and I was like, hey, are we going to go to this party or what? And he's like, no, I'm just going to sleep. And then I reminded him, it's Valentine's Day. It's our first one together. And at that time, I actually started to get really hungry. And this idiot, I mean, sorry, maybe it's too early to give away that he's an idiot, but he is. Um, he didn't have any food in his house. And all I could think about was like this bag of frozen dumplings I had waiting for me at home that I wanted to fry up and eat. So I told him, I said, you know what? I'll just see you later this week. I'm going to go home. 
And then he started yelling at me, and he said, how could you leave me? It's Valentine's Day. Um, you're going to let me stay here all by myself, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, at that point, like, my stomach was more important to me, and I just really wanted to eat those dumplings, so I left. And the next day, I came back to his house, and um, he surprised me with a box of Godiva chocolates, and he apologized for yelling at me on Valentine's Day. And I thought, oh, man, like, you know what? All that mattered was we were together. It's okay that it wasn't romantic. And um, this actually started becoming a pattern in our relationship. Um, one of the other things he loved to do was rant and rave about how much he hated America. And he'd just be like, it's a shit country. Um, it produces shit people. And um, we had a mutual acquaintance, this woman named Kathy. And he was like, she's a bitch, and she's disgusting, and she's evil. And it's because America made her. And then at that point, I was like, no, actually, Canada made her, but OK, whatever. And, um, and I kind of explained away like his ranting and raving as, um, oh, OK, so um, he has opinions. That's cute. Um, so one day, it was like a really hot summer New York day, the kind that's just like stifling and like you can't breathe. And I went over to his house, and when I entered his apartment, I was greeted with him only wearing his um, white briefs, and he was sitting in a chair. And one of his legs was sort of draped over the chair, and he was kind of hunched over, and then like so like a little bit of his belly was like hanging over the waistband. He had a fan blowing in his face. He was all sweaty and red. And the minute I came in, he goes, oh, it's so fucking hot. It's disgusting. I hate it here. And he went, on his, he went on his usual rant or whatever. And I just stood there looking at him. And I was like, shit, man. He's a baby. A big fucking whiny baby. Like, I don't care if he looks like George Michael. He's so unattractive to me right now. And at that moment, I just told him, I was like, you know what? I think... I never want to see you again. And I packed up all my stuff, um, and I took like my toothbrush and like various articles of clothing, and I was very thorough because I didn't want to have to ever fucking see his face again to get the rest of my stuff, and I needed all of my stuff because I was poor. I made $7 an hour, so I had to, you know, I had to be thorough. And um, so on the bus ride home, I felt, I felt really empowered because eighth grade had killed my self-esteem. So it almost put me in a position to date, like a guy that was so clearly had issues, but I put up with it because I felt like I didn't deserve better and I couldn't get better. So I was so empowered on the bus ride home, and um, it's one of those defining moments in my life where um, whenever I feel like um, my inner strength is tested, I think about this guy and how I got the fuck away from him. And I realize, shit, I'm strong enough to do anything because I had a guy that looked like George Michael and I left him. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God, this is my, Meg Chang! <laughs> this is my favorite George Michael song. People always think it's going to be faith. It's not. It's it's freedom. Ninety six. Um, Meg was Costa gay. What was that gay porn before the nap about? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Godiva's not going to make up for you fucking other dudes. Um, I had this boyfriend, he was, he was so wildly pretentious. He was like a, a British Indian um, Willy Wonka. <laughs> and he called it Godiva. <laughs> Our next storyteller coming to the stage. When I asked her, what do you love about storytelling? She said, because I don't have to be funny. Please welcome to the stage, Deanna Mitchell. Zeke 
Nicholson, DQ Nicholson, Z. Um, so this past decade has been really interesting. It seems like, I can't, um, <laughs> it seems like, uh, we're really fixated on the past just cause I've been around for so many decades, I would know. Um, but we're looking back a lot and probably cause things are pretty grim for the future, but just in the television that's being made, the movies that are made, the clothes that we wear, it's just we're always throwing things back to certain decades and what we appreciate and what kind of hits close to home for us as individuals. And some people would think maybe we're getting lazy, but I think it is a beautiful human condition and I respect it because there is absolutely nothing like those isolated moments when you're a kid and something small, it's these small moments that affect you for the rest of your lives to the point where I think we're always trying to recreate those moments. So I grew up in Akron, Ohio, which um, is very much like whatever you thought of when I said Akron, Ohio, that's what it is. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> But it's really, really an amazing place in the summertime. And my earliest memories, I'm like three, and we had this massive backyard. Like if you were like, is your backyard a thousand acres? I would be like, what's an acre? Yes, it is a thousand of those. I just felt like the whole world was right there. And I can just see my like little chubby legs running and piddle paddling and zigzagging all over the place. And these pine trees lined the entire thing and they would like tower over us, creating this perfect canvas. And sunbeams would come through and you'd like be running a million miles a minute and you'd stop and it'd hit you. And the sun would like hit your face or your limbs and you'd just sit there. And for me, that's like, that's my moment. That's the thing I'm probably trying to recreate all the time, just that piece. So we had a backyard neighbor um, and she had a tree house, but it wasn't in a tree. It was just like elevated, <laughs> um, which is fine. I was a little bitter about it, but I was in it. And one time I fell face forward onto like a stone at the base of the ladder. And, uh, I hit my head and like, I swear the stone cracked, but that might just be me and my brother. Um, but my brother like runs and gets my mom and my mom like breaks out of the house, slamming the screen door and like sprinting across the field and I'm like she's never gonna make it it's too big of a field um, but she like comes to get me and I find myself that night on the couch just like reveling in the pity kisses and there's people in the house I feel like I was a staple in the community I don't know why they were there but <laughs> um, I just love it was a great moment and it's the first moment where I remember having my best friend next to me and my best friend is Piggy. Uh, Piggy is a stuffed pig and um, he's pink and he's got a turquoise tail and a turquoise feet and a cute little nose and um, he was there for my first like low moment. From then on out we're best friends like Piggy is my guy, we're inseparable. And so I go on, we move to Atlanta when I'm about six or seven years old and I'm getting older and my mom's like, you know what? We probably need to put Piggy up in safekeeping because you're getting older, Piggy needs to be sewn up, he's losing his muscle. Um, so we put Piggy away and I continue life, I grow up, but then I get hit with this very trying time, right? Um, life is coming at me fast and I think most people in here have experienced it. It's the sixth grade. Um, and a lot is, a lot's happening. Like people are starting to smell bad. Um, <laughs> boys are wearing Axe body spray, which is like, you hate it, but you kind of love it. I feel like it's the first time straight women have a very deep internal conflict. Um, and so, Everything's happening very quickly. My, I'm homeschooled, but my soccer team's talking about sex stuff, and I have no idea what's going on. And so I need that peace. I need something to bring me back down. I've always been very against growing up. So I'm like, let's, let's bring Piggy out. So my mom reluctantly brings Piggy out. 
I was on a travel soccer team. So we go to the armpit of America, Pensacola, Florida, for a tournament. And, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and it's, again, it's like me continuing to grow up. So I'm like kicking ass on the soccer field with my girlfriends. And at night we're at the pool, like gossiping about BJs. Still don't know what that is, <laughs> but they all do. And, and it's funny, I've taken Piggy with me on this trip with me and she's like, or he's back in the hotel room and I'm, I'm growing up, right? And it's weird that these two things, I'm having this defining ex experience with these two things. Um, so it's time to go home and my mom's like, all right, let's pack things up, make sure you do the sweep. And I, everyone knows what the sweep is, but no one feels obligated to define it like my parents did but it's when you check to see if you have shit before you leave on the floor. Um, and so like, I know to do the sweep, but I'm a kid and I don't. And so I just don't check around for things and I don't realize the severity of this neglect until I get back home and I'm like, damn, I don't, I probably didn't say damn, but I'm like, I don't have Piggy. And I really didn't know how to, <laughs> react, I was completely distraught because as someone who did not want to grow up, who was very scared of the future that awaited her, uh, I, it was my final token of my childhood. And, and I couldn't obviously like define what was going on in me, but I, I, it was a wave in our household. Like for a week, I just couldn't bring myself to be okay. My parents sprang to action. My mom was on the phone with the hotel. My dad traveled to Mobile, Alabama a lot. The Southeast is full of amazing cities, guys. You really gotta check it out. But he's in um, Mobile, and he usually would fly back to Atlanta, but he drove through Pensacola to try to see if he could retrieve Piggy. No luck. So he traveled all the time when I was a kid. So he would go to toy stores, always ask for pink piggies. In airports, he looked. eBay, Etsy, like we spend our lives dedicated to finding Piggy. So right after college, I come straight to Los Angeles and it's almost as bad as like the sixth grade. Um, it was really scary, it was terrifying. Life is coming at you fast. Adulthood's coming at you very quickly. And you're looking for comfort because you were completely lost. And um, my parents and my brother came out for my birthday not short after and at dinner, they plopped this very large pink box in front of me. And it's funny, I hate pink, so I was very confused, but I do love gifts. So um, <laughs> I dive in and I'm just like unwrapping it so fast. Uh, and I open the box and I move away some pink tissue paper and I just see a turquoise tail. And I don't even know how to react. I push the box away and I bury my hand, my face in my hands, and it is insane how vivid the feeling was where I was back in my yard in Akron, Ohio, and I can see my brother in his big ears, and I can see his like plastic bat and wiffle ball and my neighbor and her freckles and her weird laugh, and I'm just, I access that peace that we are constantly, constantly looking for. And it gave me perspective that it's not about the pig, even though it 100% is about the pig, but it's <laughs> the fact that we have it here. We always have it with us. And it's beautiful that we have these tokens that can transform us or take us back and give us what we're looking for. And um, it's really appropriate because my five-year anniversary is this weekend. And so uh, I c would be remiss not to credit Piggy for getting me as far as I have in this city. Um, so this is for Piggy, of course. Deanna Mitchell. This is a good song choice, but I'm surprised you didn't go with Britney Spears, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. Um, Deanna, that was so beautiful. I feel like we had opposite experiences growing up. We had a father who loved you. Searched all over the country for a stuff big for you. I'm not jealous. I don't care. Fine. Um, <laughs> happy memories of your brother playing wiffle ball with you. My brother used to play a kissing game with me that I don't want to talk about. 
desperately trying to hold on to your childhood. I was desperately trying to get out, you know. My mom, like, was, she was, like, my mom was, like, so scared that, like, somebody was going to molest me, you know. Uh, and she'd, she'd always, she'd be like, Melanie, you know, if anybody tries to bad touch you, you got to tell mommy. And I was like, I wish I'm out here in these streets trying to get molested. So our final storyteller <laughs> coming to the stage, um, when I asked him, what do you love about storytelling? He said, because it's like therapy in front of a group of people. So please welcome to the stage, Rich Tackenberg. Oh, Rich coming in from the side. Oh, mixing it up. All right. Okay, get in there, Rich. This is mm. a cliffhanger. All right, let's see. The last screenwriter, I don't know, my glasses on, Amanda Pomeroy. Woo! Fantastic. All right. One more school story to close out the show. Uh, when I started junior high, I was the third fattest kid in the school. Um, in, you know, I'm not in great shape today, but back then I looked like a balloon filled with cake batter. And I knew in school the fat kids got picked on, and I did not want to get picked on. So I developed an interesting strategy. I would disappear by simply never speaking in public, never talk in front of other people. And by the end of seventh grade, it was working. I had made myself wonderfully irrelevant at my school. I was sort of a non-issue very quickly. But that only worked at school. I still had to get to and from school via the school bus. And there wouldn't light a problem for me because every morning when I got on, I couldn't sit next to the preppy kids in the front and I didn't dare sit with the stoners in the back. So I had to choose between that sort of middle like nether region of kids with undefined levels of coolness yet that were constantly moving and jockeying for social status and me sitting next to you would lower your social status for the duration of the bus ride so no one ever wanted to sit next to me they'd always be pushing their books over to the side or trying to sort of take up the room or just sort of glaring at me like I shouldn't sit there which was the worst every day twice a week so one day I sit next to the dirt bag. The dirt bag actually lives on the corner of my street. He is barely cooler than me. He's basically just denim and grease. Uh, and the only reason I think he is a little cooler than me is because his brother, who had just graduated, had been very cool. So he has a little bit of a legacy. So I sit down next to him, and he's clearly not happy. And he decides to just randomly call me fatty out loud. And this gets a bit of a little laugh from the kids who are sort of half interested. So he improves upon that and then yells that I'm fatso. Very clever. But this is before cell phones. There's nothing to do on a school bus. So this gets everyone attention. And uh, sort of urged on by the attention, he uh, sort of releases the bon mot and calls me fatty fatso. And now everyone is laughing at me. And I say nothing because I have taught myself to say nothing and I don't know what else to do. And I'm also scared because he may be also a loser, but he's in decent shape and he has nothing to lose. I am afraid of actually getting hurt if I were to challenge him. So I don't know what to do. I decide to just say nothing and hope that this goes away. And the next day, it does not go away. He has now found someone to pick on. And so he picks on me and he makes fun of me day after day and day after day. I say nothing and I do nothing and it does not get better and after two weeks I am just I'm I want to call in sick I don't want to go to school uh, it's just it's just the worst but I go anyway and by that Friday we're all waiting the for the bus at the school and if you remember sort of holding loose leaf binders he books me he smacks my books down from the back and my loose leaf binder smashes open and all my papers go everywhere and I'm running to grab all of them and I'm just so mad and I quietly call him an asshole and he perks up and he it's obviously for some reason it's what he wanted and he challenges me to a fight but not there when we get home off the school bus on Monday afternoon Okay, and I don't know what to say so my not saying anything is effectively saying yes 
And as I'm on the bus riding home, I'm like playing, and I, it occurs to me, although there's nothing I can do about it, oh, he's trying to raise his coolness with the other bullies. So I'm the meat that he needs to beat up to ascend on a certain coolness scale. This really isn't about me, but I don't know how to get out of this. And I do something that I never do, which is I tell my dad. I love my dad. He's very, he's very warm. Uh, but my dad grew up in a rough part of Brooklyn, and he was in a lot of fights. And he says, look, I can, I can talk to his parents, but I really think you need to defend yourself here. And, I'm, and I sort of realize as much as, as scary as that is that he's right. That's what I need to do. And my dad is, is going to teach him. And the first thing my dad says is, there's no such thing as a clean fight. If someone attacks you, you fight back any way you have to. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He says, well, a trick for me is when I would start a fight, I would just rip open their jacket or their shirt, just rip it open because the person doesn't expect that. They don't see that coming. They don't know what that is. And so they look down to figure out what just happened and when he's looking down break his nose and I'm like I what how about defending a punch let's like let's let's roll this back so we spend most of the weekend really talking about blocking and just if I can just survive I will be happy so the next Monday is excruciating but no one says anything about it. Monday, I get on the bus. Nobody says anything. And we're driving home, and it's, and it's quiet. And I'm like, OK, whatever. Please, 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 whatever. Maybe this was all whatever. And there's three girls sitting behind me, and they start whisper chanting, fight, 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 fight. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And we get to the first stop, and no one gets off. And we get to the second stop, and no one gets off. And I'm like, oh. And we get to our stop, and me and the dirt bag and the entire school bus gets off at the same time. And we walk down sort of the main avenue where we get dropped off, and we turn the corner in front of the bully's house onto our sort of side street. And the bully just drops his, uh, the, 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 the dirt bag sort of just drops his book bag. And before I can even process what's going on, we're now circled by 30, 13, and 14 year olds screaming, fight, 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 fight. And I just can't believe I'm in this situation, and I don't know what to do, and I just think of my dad, and I charge the dirt bag, and I rip open his denim jacket. And my dad is really smart, because the dirt bag looks down, and he's grabbing the collar. What, what, what? And he's completely defenseless. And I freeze, because I am scared out of my mind, and I don't know how to throw a punch. And by the time I finally just will myself to just throw it, I lob in a punch, he's already looking up, and he swats it away. And so he takes a shot at my face, and I successfully block it. But I find out that blocking a punch is a synonym for getting hit in the arm with a punch, and it hurts a lot. And I'm taking punches left and right, and the, and, but I'm defending myself, and I have no upper body strength. I'm not landing anything. And the kids are starting to get bored, mostly because they don't know that while it looks kind of even, I'm way out of breath, and the dirt bag is just getting going. And he gets a shot in my gut, and I'm like, don't go down. Go, like, it's getting really bad. And I hear screaming. And out of the dirt bag's house comes his older brother. He comes running out of the house. He runs in between us. He's like, what are you? Stop it, stop it. And he's pushing us away. But I realize he's holding back his brother, the dirt bag, from hitting me, which I really appreciate. And he's screaming, and he says, Rich, just go home. Go home. Go home. And I have the opportunity to just say nothing and get out of there. But for some reason, I see an opportunity. And as the kids are sort of like trying to figure out what's going on, I yell to the dirtbag, oh, so you had to have your brother save you, huh? And the kids sort of laugh a little bit. And I say, oh, it's, that's why you wanted to fight in front of your house, because you had your backup plan ready to go. And the kids start laughing. And the kid's brother looks at me like, are you freaking kidding me? And I look at him and I'm thinking, there's no such thing as a clean fight. And as I start to walk backwards, I'm like, I better get out of here before your dad comes out to kick my ass. And I hear the other kids like, ha, 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 and laughing as they're dispersing. And I think, ah, my punches didn't land, but my words did. 
And so the next morning, I get onto the school bus, and those same kids give me the same look of disdain that they had given me every day of that year. They hadn't changed one bit. And defeated, I sit next to this other kid, and he looks at me just really unpleasantly. And I just sit down, I take a breath, and I think to myself, okay, if he starts to make fun of me, I know what I'm going to say. Thank you. Rich Tackenberg! Wow! What a wonderful reminder that kids are evil. <laughs> Let that be your birth control for the evening. You guys, that's our show! Thank you so much for coming out. Make sure that you come back for part two next month on Tuesday, August 28th. Gary? Okay, you can look it up on the internet. Um, it's on the program. Uh, it's going to be right here at Dynasty Typewriter, same time, 8 p.m. It's going to be amazing. We're going to see all the scripts that were generated from these beautiful stories. Um, and please help us thank Alex Linares for his help recording tonight's show. Alex's footage. Thank you, Alex. Um, Alex's footage will be uh, up on the Shoot 'em Up YouTube channel, and Alex and his production company and crew are available to all, especially all our Shoot 'em Up filmmakers. So hit up Alex. You guys are amazing. Thank you to our producers, Gary and Monty. Thank you to you guys for being the best audience, and we'll see you next month.